The alternative name, Welsh rarebit, first cropped up in 1785 for reasons that aren't entirely clear, as the word rarebit has no other meaning beyond describing this dish. Really? I'm actually learning something. This is kind of fun. Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark. More on them in a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, am your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome to the show. What happens here? Danny writes me a script. Canalize food products. They're never what they say on the tin. This seems to be a reoccurring uh, thing lately. I just recorded a video all about, like, medicines made out of weird shit. And now we're doing, like, stuff in tins. Creative geniuses here at Brainblaze. Let's just get into it, shall we? I've been busy working on a business proposal to open the Swang Song Restaurant of Rong in Kwantong in Hong Kong, which would. <laughs> mm. Danny thinks he's challenging me, but I'm a legend of speech. I am a god king. You challenge me, mortal. Which would be open all summer long, the idea would be to stuff the kitchens with the world's most misleadingly titled foods to create a delectable menu of mistruth. Here's a taster of what's in store for those who might not be able to tag along with the throng who belong in the wrong ding dong. Danny, Danny, bring it on, mate. Come on. All you need to do is put the word effortlessly. 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 Got it. All you need to do is put that word in there and we'll be golden. I mean, you'll be golden. I'll be struggling. <laughs> crab sticks. Oh, yeah, that is not made out of crab. Everyone knows that. And they are... I don't know why I like them. I don't know why I like crab sticks. I don't even know if I like them anymore, but I used to like them. And that's a weird thing to like. I can remember the first time I figured out the truth about crab sticks. As a kid, I used to enjoy munching on those little smooth white tubes of fishy goodness coated in a mysterious pink substance. And I always kind of assumed I was eating crab because the words crab sticks were boldly emblazoned on the packaging in massive red letters. I'm pretty sure nowadays they have to call them just fish sticks or something or like mysterious gelatinous subject sticks because... It probably can't say crab anymore because there's probably no crab in them. Isn't there some rule that if it's like less than 50% of what it says on the tin, you can't have it in, you can't name it that? This isn't what I ordered. But if you squinted hard enough, you could just make out a tiny word discreetly sandwiched in the middle. The complete title of the product was crab flavored sticks. And when I turned over the packaging to look at the ingredients, I was perplexed to find that we kicked off uh, with the surprisingly vague <laughs> other fish. <laughs> to put it another way, the main ingredient of crab flavored sticks is any fish other than a crab, which is technically a crustacean anyway. <laughs> Exquisite. You wouldn't be allowed to get away with that in most countries today. Here in the UK, we now tend to call them seafood sticks. Okay, that makes sense. The US manufactured sticks were forced to legally identify them as imitation crab sticks. <laughs> that is just not appealing. Until 2006, when the seafood industry successfully lobbied the FDA and got the name changed to crab flavored seafood made with surimi, a fully cooked fish protein. Bro, is that even better? I thought it was, I literally thought this was going to be one of those stories where the US is lobbied so f***ing hard that it's like, no, 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 you have to call them imitation crab sticks. And then some lobbying happens and now they are crab sticks again. <laughs> because money talks, bitches. To be honest, I think imitation crab sounded more appealing, but as the name change indicates, this imposter crab, which was first introduced in Japan in the 1970s under the name of Kanakama, is actually produced from surimi, which is a mixture of ground fish and starch and fillers. Lovely. They sometimes do it, you know, if you go to like a cheap sushi place, they'll be like, you know, those California rolls or those little rolls, the maki, is it maki, with the seaweed and then the rice and the thing in the middle? And you know you've got cheap, you know you're having cheap sushi, when it's like either that thing in the middle is a bit of avocado or it is a crab stick. That's some cheap sushi. I'm just not a big knowledgeable person about sushi, so if they're putting like, you know, the red tail finest magical fish in there, or if it's a little crab stick, I'm probably not going to know the difference because it's mostly rice and seaweed and it's much cheaper. I'm sure I could learn something about this, but then it's like then I'd have to spend lots of money on sushi, which would be expensive. It's like the problem. Like lately, I've been drinking more wines and I've been buying like interesting wine, not like some Johnny Depp shit, just spending more than like, you know, two pounds on a bottle of wine equivalent. And I'm like, yeah, now I lo I'm like, yeah, but I like this now. I don't want to go back to two pound wine. <laughs> And I don't want the same to happen with me and sushi. I want to, you know, 
I want to keep myself grounded. I demand satisfaction. Not like, <laughs> why is Johnny Depp spending like 20 grand a month on wine or something? <laughs> Fuck Johnny. Or he was like, someone said he was spending that much and he was like, oh no, that's far too little. <laughs> the fish in question is often the mild and bland pollock and when it's shredded and pressed into the surimi base, the result is a completely tasteless lump of mushy paste. It's only the seasonings that add any sense of flavor. The surimi is then pressed into a shape that vaguely resembles the leg of a snow crab, an illusion which is enhanced by the coating of that mysterious pink or red substance, which is of course just artificial colorings. I always thought it was red. And it's kind of harder, isn't it? It kind of feels like it's keeping the the stuff inside somehow, even though you know it's not because it's just on one side, right? It's been a long time. It's been a long time. Although the naming is a little more accurate today, certain big restaurant chains can still drop the ball. When Frankie and Benny's launched their crab bruschetta in 2014, the staff initially reassured customers that it was produced from 100% crab meat. Following these suspicions from less, is Frankie and Benny's? It's definitely, it's like a UK, we have it as a restaurant in the UK and it's like an American restaurant. Do you actually have it in America, Americans? I've always been curious about that because it feels like too American. Like you go there and you're like, restaurants in America aren't actually like this. Like you don't, there's, right? And they're not, they're not quite that American. Although America is very American in general. Following suspicions from less than satisfied customers, an office manager responded with a written admission that imitation crab was thrown into the mix, but he insisted that real crab was still the main ingredient. The crab bruschetta was eventually pulled from the menu when the chain's marketing team got involved and admitted that the main ingredient was imitation crab. I still think the manufacturers are missing a trick, though. If you're going to lie, you might as well do it properly. They should have called them golden lobster tails. <laughs> 50p for a pack! <laughs> Sweetbreads. I have to admit that I've never ordered sweetbreads in a restaurant because possibly my own culinary adventures don't usually venture much deeper than the bottom of a pot noodle. I would have imagined that the dish might involve bread, perhaps of the sweet variety, and I'll be a bit pissed off when I ended up getting served a plate of offal. Oh yeah, no, this is what sweetbreads is. I was like, I know sweetbreads. What is sweetbreads? And it's like, yeah, it's it's the insides. Sweetbreads is an astonishingly inaccurate name for the thymus glands, pancreas, throats, tongues, and and other dangly bits of calves or lambs. Oh my god. <laughs> Why are we eating the pancreas? What the fuck? <laughs> and I know I've eaten lots of pancreas in my life, because you're like you go to rest you know, you're like, oh what's this processed meat? What's it mostly it's mostly made from pancreas. Okay. Step back and think I'm more a vomit! <laughs> Those thymus glands need to be grabbed pretty quickly as they help young animals fight off disease, but they disappear after around six months. Oh god. Sweetbreads are a royal pain in the ass to make at home, as the preparation involves soaking these organs for several hours and then blanching them before you can even begin to think about eating them up. Apparently, they do crisp up nicely and taste rich, mild, and creamy, if not exactly sweet or yeasty. But the name is awfully misleading. Ah, daddy, brilliant wordplay. First coins in 1565, the sweet is possibly just an indication that the meat isn't as savory as most, whilst the bread is likely to have emerged from the Middle English word breeder, which used to be an old term for a piece of roasted meat. But it does beg the question, what do you ask if you just want to order, you know, a sweet variety of bread? In my swan song restaurants of wrong, I'd probably have assumed that kind of deviant bakery labeled under massive bull testicles. And well, speaking of which, Rocky Mountain Oysters. Ah, those beautiful pearls of the sea, traditionally plucked from the saltwater areas of the glorious Rocky Mountains. <laughs> I've been to the Rocky Mountains. I went to, uh, um, oh god, what's it called? There's a place where the Coors Brewery is. I talked about this before, and they give you free beer. You have to go through the brewery tour. I've like, I went to, I've been on a few brewery tours. I went to one in Amsterdam uh, at the Heineken Brewery or whatever, which I'm sure is like, it's a huge tourist trap or whatever. But I bet you pay like 20 euros, then you go around, and it's just like a regular brewery tour. But it's so hot in there. You get to the end, and there's like some Heineken, and you get to taste it. And it's just Heineken, which I know Danny hates, but I'm like, oh my god. After this hot brewery tour, you're like, Pfft. Give me the Heineken! And they're like, look how the bubbles are coming to the top. Look how the bubbles are coming to the top of the Heineken. Why am I doing it like Sean Connery? I can't do a Dutch accent at all. But look, it's coming to the top of the... They're, they're like, it's going to the top of the... And you're like, oh my god, I just want to drink it. I just want to drink it. But you had to pay 20 euros to go in. The cause one was free. And then afterwards, they're like, you get like three beers. Like three proper beers. And then people would just be like, cool, I'm just going to go around again and then have my three free beers. And I'm like, this is mad. I love it. I love everything about it. Yeah! 
The only trouble is that you don't tend to find much salt water near the Rocky Mountains, and this helps explain why those aren't really oysters on your plate. You're actually sinking your teeth into the juicy, deep-fried testicles of bulls, sheep, and mountain goats. These testicles have been skinned, pounded flat, and breaded. They were traditionally... I'm like, I would eat this. Because I'm not like, I, I like trying weird foods. Like, I'm quite into like eating all sorts of weird shit. And if they're safe to eat, great, I'll give it a crack. But it is kind of like, ooh, isn't it? They were traditionally thrown onto branding coals to cook, but a deep fat fryer is generally preferred by restaurants these days. The ranchers of the Rockies have always devoted a lot of time to dehorning, branding, and castrating their spring calves, largely to increase the quality of the carcass meat, but also to protect the herd and perhaps even the ranchers from unwelcome sexual activity. Holy shit. That means that at the end of the day, those ranchers are literally rolling around in hundreds and hundreds of loose testicles, and it seems such a shame to see anything go to waste. I think what got me about that was not the fact, I'm trying to think about what it was, it's not the fact that we're eating testicles, it's that they're being pound flat. Whew! Which is just like, oh boy, no, 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 no. Might as well deep all those suckers and pile them off as Rocky Mountain oysters to other suckers. The delicacy has spawned its own devoted following of bollock chewers, and several dedicated festivals are held every year. The most famous one is Testy Festy in Clinton, Montana, to which 15,000 fans turn up each year and get through 50,000 pounds of testicles over five days. It's probably not an ideal place to take your granny, though. Things can get a bit seedy at Testy Festy. Aside from the testicle-eating competitions, you can also get involved in wet t-shirt contests or the Undy 500 Relay, in which often semi-naked men and women get a chance to show off their skills in both tricycle riding and rapid beer consumption. <laughs> I have to say, this sounds like a right laugh. <laughs> the actual naming of Rocky Mountain oysters boils down to a bit of cowboy humor. They're also known as prairie oysters in Canada, whilst other popular names include cowboy caviar, dusted nuts, Montana, tender groins, and my own favorite, swinging beef. It's a good name. It's a good name. And you have to admit that any of those sound marginally more appetizing and marketable than deep fried bull testicles. No sh. So let me interrupt today's video to tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, Surfshark. What is Surfshark? Well, it's right there in the name. It's surfing. And it's just nice, a VPN. <laughs> Because you're surfing the web and you're avoiding the sharks. Oh, I see. That's clever. Look, Surfshark allows you to do a bunch of stuff online. They keep you safe online. There's just there's just multiple benefits, really. Uh, what should we talk about? VPNs. VPNs. First of all, streaming options, right? I don't know. Let's say you've watched everything on Netflix or you've watched every. I, I don't know. I've definitely. You'd think that with Netflix, right, there's so much content that you're never going to run out. <laughs> You did wrong. And I don't mean by literally watching everything, because I just don't want to watch, like, another reality show that's a bit sh**. So, what you can do is you fire up your VPN and you jump over to another country, like hit up somewhere in Europe or Canada, or if you're outside of America, in America, Japan, wherever, and you'll find that there's a whole new bunch of stuff for you to watch, because, well, it's just better that way, isn't it? I like coming back to the, uh, the idea I was listening to another podcast um, someone was doing, and they were saying how they had to sign up to a new subscription service. I won't name it, but like they had to sign up to that because they didn't have The Office on Netflix. And I was like, what are you talking about? I watch The Office on my Netflix all the time. And it just seems to be some sort of restriction thing in the US. So you fire up your Surfshark, you jump on over to somewhere outside of uh, America. And at least when I did this like a month ago. No, I mean, you can still get it. Like I watched it last night. So you can still see The Office. Just use Surfshark VPN. Also, it keeps, keeps you safe. So uh, I don't know, you're using that dodgy Wi-Fi and you're like, oh, uh, shall I log into my internet banking? You can if you've got your Surfshark running. Just go in there. There's like this thing. You just click quick connect, connect, and this little thing spins around, and it's like boom, you are connected. And it's super fast. You don't have to worry about, about any of that stuff. Not that you need speed for internet banking, but for like Netflix and stuff, it works great. You have nothing to worry about. So all you need to do is go to surfshark.deals forward slash blaze, and you'll get 83% off and three extra months for free. Again, surfshark.deals slash blaze for 83% off and three extra months for free. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Surfshark. And now back to today's video. <laughs> buffalo wings. I'm displaying my own lack of gastronomical gumption again when I admit that I've never eaten buffalo wings or ever really given the name much thought. What are you You've never eaten buffalo wings? Isn't that just... Unless I'm mistaken, it's like buffalo sauce, which is like a type of barbecue sauce uh, on wings, on chicken wings, right? Where they've been divided into two pieces. This is common. This is something... Don't you get this at like TGI Fridays in the UK and like or Frankie and Benny's? There's a bunch of places that I order, like, wings. I love wings. I'm, I'm mad for wings. Like, I don't like ordering them so much because they deep fry them. 
but I make wings in an air fryer and they're like 90% as good and then it's there's no oil there's no deep frying which i know I, it's chicken wings it's not healthy for you but it's a sure lot better than fried chicken wings i mean i always felt pretty sure that they weren't really buffalo wings which would obviously be a much bigger thing because they have to carry more weight and so i would imagine it's pretty common knowledge that the name is derived from the location from which the winged dish first sprouted the city of buffalo in new york of course the city didn't invent the concept of eating wings but the name relates specifically to the hot spicy sauce which is smothered all over the deep fried chicken wings to create the distinct dish but there's quite a bit of controversy over who is the first to start serving it so the popular legend goes the buffalo wings were first served by the bellissimo family in the anchor bar in buffalo in the 1960s but the weird thing is that none of the now deceased family members could agree on the details of the origins i've made a video about this before it was like some family and then she was like i've only got these leftover things and she chopped them in half to make the two like wings so there's the winglet and there's the drum mini drumstick piece something like that the son of the owners frank and teresa bellissimo claims that his mother came up with the idea of serving the wings to the catholic patrons the very late on friday nights oh wait that's not the story i know during this period many catholics only ate fish and vegetables on fridays so it was a special treat to tuck into something meaty when the clock finally struck midnight teresa herself <laughs> what it's just one day a week that you have to eat fish instead of meat i love meat but there's no way that i'll be like waiting till midnight to have some meat because i didn't get to have meat for a day that's insane teresa herself claims that her son once unexpectedly bought a brought a bunch of hungry friends back from college this is the story that i know under pressure to rustle up something quick and easy for the whole gang she took the usually discarded chicken wings smothered them in cayenne hot sauce and lobbed them in the deep wrap fryer well students will apparently eat any old shit. meanwhile husband frank tells the conflicting story that the delivery drivers made a giant cock up one day and dumped dumped a tongue of ton of chicken wings at the restaurant instead of the backs and necks that he had ordered you need those backs and necks okay my neck my back lick my pussy the recipe was born out of a desperation to shift a load of unwanted wings the odd thing about all of these stories is that there's no evidence that buffalo wings ever appeared on the menu at the anchor bar in the 1960s the comprehensive article on the restaurants appeared in the courier express in 1969 and made no mention of this supposedly speciality dish at all despite this when july the 29th was officially declared to be chicken wing day in 1977 really the serving mayor of buffalo credited the bellissimo family as the inventors and that's perhaps not entirely fair on an african-american by the name of john young who was allegedly serving up his own dish in his own buffalo restaurant wings and things several years before the bellissimos so that was a fucking lie this was during the shameful years of segregation and it could be the case that whilst white people had their first taste of buffalo wings at the anchor bar black customers had already been enjoying them for years at wings and things which is a better name like if i was if i was looking at the anchor bar or wings and things i'd be like wings and things because they specialize in wings and things whereas the anchor bar is like i just assumed that's for drinking incidentally even the naming of buffalo city doesn't really make much sense whilst it was unnamed buffalo creek which flows right through it the naming of the creek is odd as it's unlikely that any buffalo ever planted a hoof anywhere near it the pity they didn't call it chicken creek that would have solved so many problems <laughs> welsh rabbit wait isn't this welsh rabbit it's like cheese on toast but Danny said it's rabbit. More commonly known as Welsh rabbit. In some corners of the world, this deceptive dish was originally named Welsh rabbit in 1725. It was? Oh, sh! I always thought that was just people mispronouncing it. And it's notable for not being Welsh and not containing rabbit. In fact, the simple dish of melted cheese dumped all over toasted bread is the only item on our menu to have derived its name from a pretty cruel insult. This was essentially a poor man's supper, which was served to the family when the hunter of the house had experienced a bad day in the office and had failed to catch anything half decent in the woods. The name was an English dig at the Welsh. It was suggested that the Welsh could never even afford relatively cheap rabbit, so they had to make do with cheese on toast instead. <laughs> Another suggestion was that only people who were as poor and as stupid and as vulgar as the Welsh would be dumb enough to serve up cheese on toast and call it rabbit. I really want some cheese on toast now. It's so delicious. I love that. The alternative name, Welsh rabbit, first cropped up in 1785 for reasons that aren't entirely clear, as the word rabbit has no other meaning beyond describing this dish. Really? I'm actually learning something. This is kind of fun. This is what you guys must feel like. <laughs> 
Nah, not on this channel at least. We never learn anything. It is possible the restaurants invented the new name to avoid confusing international customers. You might reasonably expect to be getting served a rabbit of Welsh origin, but it's perhaps more likely that the Welsh played a part in pushing forward the new name as they weren't too keen on the snotty implications melting all over the original choice. I'm still inclined to just call it cheese on toast though. Yeah, it is. It's just cheese on toast. It's the sort of thing they call it in a restaurant so it doesn't look like they're serving cheese on toast. Oh, and I'd highly recommend Welsh beef tenderloin if you ever get a chance to try it. Don't be put off by the fact that it looks like a raw potato drenched in cold spaghetti. <laughs> Hot dogs. Finally. I hope it's pretty unlikely that anyone would expect to find any traces of dog meat within a hot dog, but perhaps that hasn't always been the case. When the Germans produced sausages in the 19th century, they were commonly referred to as dogs because customers were suspicious they might really contain dog meat. It's nice to know that some things never change, like the dodgy kebab shop or the dodgy Chinese restaurant. It's like, it's so cheap because they're serving rats. <laughs> Jokes back in the day were the same. I'm reading a book. Bing, 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 bong, 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 bong. Get those lights off. Bing, 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 bing. I'm reading a book uh, right now, which was like a uh, hundred years old. It's like um, I'm definitely gonna mispronounce his name. Is it Woodhouse? It's spelled like Woodhouse, and it's just like, holy shit, things don't change. It's like you're reading this book, and it's like, oh my god, yeah, yeah, people are the same as they were a hundred years ago. Just the environment changed. I mean, it's like. You know, obviously, some things have changed, but it's like people are still making fun of each other in kind of the same ways and stuff, and you're like, it's so strange. <laughs> Apparently, their suspicions were sometimes justified, but like so many great US traditions, the all American hot dog has thoroughly German roots. It was German immigrants who first introduced to the States the long, soft, porky Frankfurter or Wiener, or Wiener, <laughs> if you're talking about the Viennese variety. Wiener! How do you say that in German? Because they pronounce it like a V, right? Wiener. I'm just going to call it a wiener. Does that also mean penis in America? Do you use that, Americans? In the UK, at least when I was a kid, it'd be like, wiener can also mean penis. Fun. But who had the idea of shoving them in long buns and christening and hot dogs? It's another or one of those cases where nobody can agree on the definitive answer. One popular theory involves a German immigrant by the name of Feuchtwanger, who sold frankfurters from a street stall in 1880. He initially attempted to loan his customers white gloves to protect their hands from the intense heat of the sausages. When he noticed that hardly any of his customers could be asked to return the gloves, his wife proposed that it might be a more cost-effective strategy to just develop a long bun which would later which would serve as a protective layer as for the name it's often reported that the new york journal cartoonist tad dorgan came across a vendor at a polo match in 1901 who was loudly encouraging customers to grab his dachshund sausages whilst they were red hot <laughs> Gay! tad is alleged to have drawn a cartoon of the scene but he didn't know how to spell dachshund so he just wrote hot dogs instead and unwittingly coined a new term doubt has been thrown on this claim however as no such cartoon has ever been found from the large archive of tad dorgan's popular work that still exists today but why would the vendor have been selling dachshund sausages in the first place i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right if someone asked me to spell that, I'd be like, hot dog, because also, what is that? What is that? I guess it's German. That's what it is. Although we might never know the full story behind the origins of the hot dog, we know that German immigrants often brought their Dachshund dogs with them, and it's likely that the name was just a little joke as the long, thin sausages reminded them of their long, thin dogs. And the joke eventually evolved into the broader and simpler variation of hot dogs because America didn't want to waste all that time in the future trying to spell hot Dachshunds. The use of dogs in product labeling is generally misleading anyway as you don't tend to find much dog meat in biscuits either. Dog biscuits? Oh, oh yeah, but that's because they're four dogs. That'd be like cat food. It doesn't contain any cat. Having said that, I would advise steering well clear of Rocky Mountain Creamy Hot Dog Sauce just to be on the safe side. Always be on the safe side. If you're unsure, take the path of safety. And that's where this episode ends. Thanks for watching. Whoo! Which is just like, oh boy, no, 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 no.